Corinthians chapter number 5. And tonight I am going to uh, preach on a subject that is a little bit, um, I don't want to say hard to do. It is a little bit, I'm self-conscious a little bit about it like any pastor would be. Uh, because uh, it is part of the, God's word, it is part of the whole counsel of God. But it, it, uh, if people aren't gracious with their their spirit, it can seem a little self-serving. And you'll see what I'm talking about when I get into it here in a, mo- in a moment. But I want you to to follow along. I'll just read two verses from this passage of scripture, and beginning in verse number twelve, the Bible says, "We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you." And are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word, speak to our hearts, challenge us from your word, that we might uh, be found faithful, we might walk uh, uh, worthily uh, before you in love. Lord, that our, our labors together would be profitable and, and fruitful. We give you the praise and the glory for what you will do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, you can tell from the reading of the text what I'm talking about because it is a passage of Scripture that uh, talks about those that labor among you and are over you in the Lord. And there are companion uh, passages of scripture to this. And uh, it, we, just look at those real quickly here. Just turn back. Don't lose your place there in First Thessalonians. But look back into Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And there's a couple of verses in that chapter that are companion verses. There are others that we could look to that where Paul uh, is giving instructions to a young preacher named Timothy, and you can draw a lot of, of things about the ministry from those passages. But notice in Hebrews 13 and verse number 7, the Bible says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. The word conversation means way of life. Considering the end of it means uh, consider where their life would lead, what the direction of their life would lead you into, and remember them uh, uh, who have spoken unto you the word of God. And then jump on down to verse number 17 in the same chapter. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, and they as, excuse me, as they that must give, an, give account, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. These companion verses give insight into the passage in 1 Thessalonians. Because notice uh, that what they're doing in in, uh, taking the oversight, as the Bible calls it in another place, as taking the oversight, that they are doing so watching for the souls of, of people. Uh, not just their eternal soul, but as the Bible often uh, refers to the individual, their life as their soul, uh, and mean, meaning the essence of their life. And so uh, the, the, uh, those that have the rule over uh, are watching over the lives of others as they that must give an account. So they are going to give an account, uh, an account for how they've done it. And then the Bible also says here that they might do it with joy. In other words, you have, you have a great deal to do with those that preach the word of God, how, how, how readily uh, we are receptive to it makes it um, easier to do. Uh, very often, and, and this is, you can see quickly, you know, a lot of times pastors leave these kinds of passages for the evangelist to come in and preach, you know, and, it, and it's almost like setting them up as a hitman, 
you know. Hey, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, preacher must have cued him up to say those things. And, and it ought not be so that we are reluctant. The Apostle Paul often defended his apostleship uh, because he was, he was questioned about it. He was criticized about it. And so he would just very publicly uh, remind people that he was called to be a minister, that he thought himself to be nothing. Matter of fact, he considered himself to be the chiefest of sinner, uh, sinners, but he said, but God, uh, showing grace to him, counted him worthy, placing him in the ministry. And so we ought not be hesitant about it or shy about it, but because of you know, the way that people uh, look at things, uh, you know, sometimes you can't say anything without someone thinking, well, you're just feeling sorry for yourself, and that's not it at all. But it is part of, uh, an important part of the ministry of a church. And so when you take those thoughts from Hebrews 13 and you come back to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, let me illustrate what I mean when, it, when I say it gives us insight into 1 Thessalonians 5, because the Bible says here that, uh, we, that they are to be esteemed very highly in love for their work's sake. And what is the work that they, are, that they are doing? It is they are watching for people's souls. They are speaking the word of God to them. They are giving an example uh, uh, by their own life. And, uh, and they are, and, and there in 1 Thessalonians 5, they are exhorting and admonishing one another, or excuse me, others, uh, as they labor among them. And so he gives us a perspective on, on, uh, on that. And then it says uh, that uh, we are to, that they are to be esteemed highly, very highly in love for their work's sake. Uh, and Hebrews 13 says that they might do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Uh, and so it is easy to understand. And really, there are many principles. Out, there are some of the things I'll talk about tonight that are applicable to any human relationship where there is uh, the establishment of roles and or authority, like in a home. Uh, it's, uh, people think, oh, uh, you're, you know, you, you like that role of authority because, because that put, makes you the boss. Well, listen, being the boss is not always the fun thing to be, uh, because it means that you're responsible to make sure that things are as they should be, and you're going to give an account for it. Not only that, but you have a lot to say about whether that is a contentious relationship or a... A, 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 or a uh, con convenient relationship, a, a uh, comfortable relationship. And so, uh, when it, like in the home, when there, if there's rebellion in the home, it makes it a, uh, a lot of conflict in the home. And so, uh, if you hear the word of God and you obey the word of God uh, you, and you uh, hear that admonition, you make it so that it is done with joy and not with grief. In other words, that it's not a, uh, it doesn't feel like a, a, a battle to stand up and preach God's word. It is, it is um, important for us to understand what God is trying to accomplish in the New Testament church. It is not just to try to build something, to have something, it is to try to equip people that are sent out with the gospel message to a lost world that needs to be redeemed and that we can give them the God's word that will explain to them how they can have their sins forgiven. And that's really what, uh, what we're talking about. And so them which labor among you is what we're talking about. Them which labor among you. Now, the uh, minister, the, the pastor is described here as someone who has a responsibility of labor. In other words, to work. Uh, it is a, an engagement uh, that the pastor or those in ministry take on themselves 
to labor among people. That labor is a lot, and primarily so, in God's word. That, we, that the pastor labors in the word of God to find things that are going to be helpful for people because people have questions and they're, they're sometimes seeking answers. They have hurts that they need uh, help with and, and some comfort for those hurts. There are times where in every family that there is uh, hardship, there is death, there are, there are uh, you know, times where we face the greatest enemy that man has, uh, the enemy of death and uh, the greatest physical enemy, I should say, that we face, and that is death. And it is the, the pastor's responsibility. He comes alongside. It's not only the pastors, but, but it falls much uh, and in large part to the pastor. Um, for those reasons, I've gone to uh, all of the, um, and I probably need to redo it, I'm finding out that a lot of the funeral homes in town are changing hands or the children are now growing up, they're in charge and et cetera. They need to go make the rounds again. I've, I've outlived some of them or something. or, or they, Well, they, they're smart. They retired maybe. But, um, and so I need to go back and re, rehearse this. But I've made them aware that, listen, if anybody comes in, they don't have a pastor. They don't have a church. They don't have spiritual guidance. Uh, feel free to call on me. And, uh, and I don't accept things for, for doing that. I, I just want to be a blessing to people. I, I was shocked a few years back when I found out that uh, uh, how churches charge people uh, for stuff like that. I was, I was down at the subway down here, actually, uh, on the highway, and a guy came in, and he had visited one or two services years before that, and uh, and never come back. And he was he walked into the subway, and he's like, "Oh man, Pastor Wagon shoots." And I and I vaguely remembered him, but didn't know his name. And he says, "Oh man, it's so great that I ran into you." He said, "Would you? Would you? My dad is not in good shape. He says he's he's going to be dying soon. Would you be willing to do uh, the funeral?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I'd I'd be more than happy to do it." But I said, um, "You know, just." you know, give me all the particulars. But I said, you know, I don't know if he's uh, a believer or not. And he said, oh, no, he's not a believer. And I said, well, why don't you let me, you know, can I go see him before he dies and, and try to help, you know, help him get ready for eternity? And, uh, and but he told me the story about when his mother passed away and she had been a Sunday school teacher at another denomination of a, a, another kind of church for over 40 years. And when he, when she passed away, uh, contacted the pastor for the funeral and they got they sent out a list that said here's the list of costs uh, for us to have the funeral and there's a list for there's a, a a building fee to use the facility a facilities fee then there was a, a fee for uh, food uh, so much per head that you're anticipating. Then there was a fee for cleaning, and there was a, a fee for uh, the musicians, and there was a fee for this, and a fee for that. And, and all of the fees, uh, among all the fees, there was, it said in this fee, this fee includes one visit from the pastor. And if you want a second visit, it's an additional charge. And I thought, man, I've been doing this wrong all these years. And uh, <laughs> I could have been set, but, <laughs> but I was shocked. I, ne I, I never, <laughs> I didn't, they didn't teach us that in Bible college, you know, <laughs> how to make money off people's grief. And, and, uh, but it is a sad thing. And, uh, and I end up, I did do the man's funeral. And, but, but how, you know, pastors, uh, uh, when somebody uh, surrenders to serve the Lord in, in uh, the role of a pastor, uh, he takes on labor, uh, spiritual labor, uh, labor in the Word of God, labor in prayer, labor in coming alongside and, and trying to be comfort and help and strength. And, and so they labor among you, and it is important to recognize that labor. I've often said trying to help other churches as they're uh, looking for pastors and et cetera. And, I, and I've, I've made the comment to several churches that it seems like uh, the ministry is the only place where um, 
where uh, longevity and experience are not necessarily recognized. And uh, in one, there was a church that was trying to help, and they were they were they were saying, "Oh, we're you know we're thinking of um, rolling back, you know, the pastor's pay, uh, the new pastor we get, and starting them at a starting pay and whatever." And I said, "Well, you know, uh, you know, if he's been in the ministry for for uh, any length of time and he's got experience." I said, don't you take that into account? And he's, well, like, what do you mean? I said, and this man happened to be a, uh, a licensed uh, contractor uh, in one of the building trades. And, uh, and he was, I believe, an electrician. And he had had, you know, 20-some years experience in the electrical trade. And I said, if there was a company, another company other than the one you work for, and they wanted to hire you. And, uh, and you were looking for a job. And they said, yeah, we want to hire you. Uh, but you come in at a beginner's pay. I said, would you take that job? He said, well, no. Because I've got 20 years experience. I said, exactly. And, and the Bible talks about not having a novice. Not somebody that is, is uh, too... Uh, inexperienced or youthful or immature really is what it's referring to, an immaturity, and not to have them because, uh, yeah, you might save money, but it's going to cost you in, uh, in the things you're not getting. And so to esteem them highly means to uh, place a value on their labor, those that are over you in the Lord. And so... Um, Notice what they, what, uh, lastly, what they do is the Bible says here, they admonish you. They admonish you. That word admonish, if you uh, research it, it has to do with warning. You know, giving us a warning, reminding us of the dangers, reminding us of the pitfalls, reminding us of how Satan works. And very often, you know, those warnings are, are not necessarily uh, heeded. As a matter of fact, it's amazing how often, and this is just, just for your information, how often the pastor gets blamed when he's right. It's like, oh, you know, raise your kids right and do this and be aware of this with your children and, and to, to try to keep them from being, you know, led out into the world. And then when that happens, somehow they get mad at the pastor and he was the one saying, hey, be careful. And we, we need to, to be reminded sometimes that, that they're watching for your souls. They're trying to help your families. They're trying to help you to walk with God. Um, the truth is, we could go around this room and say, look, everybody, just, everybody gets to say one thing they're thankful for. We'd all have something. But if we started again the second round and said, okay, everybody give us, you know, one problem you have or one burden you're carrying. We don't have one of those too. And so it's, it's like, you know, life comes with, with uh, uh, sufficient amount of both blessings and bruises. And it is, it is the, the pastor that is called upon to, to be aware of what's going on and warn and and uh, and equip and uh, and labor among uh, the church, and so the Bible is encouraging us here to esteem them. In other words, place a value on them. So uh, let's let's get into uh, talked about the pastor's role and some of the things that that we need to be mindful of. And so, what is our response to that? Well, the Bible says in verse number twelve. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. To know them. That word K-N-O-W is an interesting word. If you look up the word, uh, the Greek word here for know, and just, just without trying to look up a definition of it, just look and see how God uses the word in the New Testament. And it is a common word. It's used almost, that, that, uh, that Greek word appears almost seven times times in the New Testament, 
almost 700. And almost equally divided over 300 times each, you'll find the word translated no. And the other times, uh, it is translated some form of the word to see. To see, to be, and it means it's referring to being aware. To see them, to to uh, be uh, aware of them and uh, of what's going on with them, to, to uh, be uh, concerned for them, basically, to know them. It means more than just to, to have some knowledge, etc., but it means that to have them in your view. And so uh, when the Bible talks about uh, dwelling with your wife according to knowledge, it's, it's talking about the same thing, to see her, to be uh, aware of her, her needs, um, her, her likes, her dislikes, to, to be aware of those things and to, to not just say, well, I think you know this or I think that. No, no, to be aware of them, to sense where they're at. Uh, not to say where they ought to be necessarily, but to sense where they are. And so uh, they are to be known. Secondly, they are, in verse number 13, to be esteemed. That means to place a value on. To place a value on. Um, it is important for us to value the things that God values. Would you agree with that? What God says is important we need to view it and treat it as important. For instance, you might not think prayer is that big a thing in your life. That may be because you're not going through deep problems right now. But you might face adversity ahead when prayer becomes very precious to you. Where getting a hold of God may be the only thing on your agenda. And we need to be mindful of the fact that what God says is important ought to be important to us. Then it says, esteem them very highly in love. They are to be loved. Uh, you say, well, what's, what's so special about that? Well, uh, we are, uh, God loved us. We love him because he first loved us. And God then tells us then that we are to love the brethren. That loving one another is... Um, the second greatest commandment. It's tied to the first, uh, that we would, would love one another. It's the earmark of Christ's followers, that they love one another. Why? By the way, just like, you know, you know what we say all the time, that uh, where the Bible says, behold, I'll give you a sign, uh, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And we say, well, yeah, that's a sign because... It's not the norm. It's, it doesn't happen every day. If it's just a young maiden, that's no sign at all because that is commonplace. When God says, here's a sign that you belong to the Lord. Here's the, the earmark that you love one another. You know what he's saying? He's saying that's not that common for man to love others as they should. It is common for us to love ourselves, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh. And so to truly love one another is, uh, is something unique. It is something rare uh, that we love one another. And the pastor is no different. Um, by the way, remember back in Hebrews, I said, as these tie together. Uh, you want the pastor watching over you with joy. You don't, don't fight the counsel and advice that is given you through the preaching of God's word. It's, it's meant to be helpful. It's meant to be uh, protective. It's meant to be a warning. It is meant to be instructive. And so uh, it is good for us. It's good. I think it's good for the choir to hear what a blessing they are. And so I try to do that. I, I think it's good uh, for those that we care about to be reminded that we love them and not just say, uh, well, you know, it's like the couple in for couples therapy. And, uh, and she, she tells the 
pastor. You know, well, you know, he never tells me I, that he loves me. And the pastor says to the man, well, what about that? He's, and the man says, well, when we got married 20-some years ago, I told her then, if anything changes, I'll let her know. Well, okay, that's just a special kind of stupid. And, uh, you know, uh, and so it's good to hear. It's good to be reminded and, and, and esteem them highly in love for their work's sake. You know, it is, it is something for us to realize that, that ministry, uh, for many times, ministry is something we kind of do on the side or whatever. But for those that are laboring among you, that take, taking the oversight, that ministry is their labor. It is their work. And just like we all like to feel like our labor matters, right? We, we like to feel like our work is, that we do a good job, and that we are appreciated for it. The, the, we need to understand that that is the ministry, that is the labor of the pastor. That is the, minister, the, the labor of those in ministry that they labor. Among, you know, the hard thing about pastoring uh, I remember when I was uh, young in the ministry and God had called me to preach and, and I was in Bible college and, you know, everybody wants to know, what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do? And, you know, it's like you, you almost have to, you know, you, you feel like you're expected to know what street you're going to go start a church on in five years or something like that or whatever. And I, I found that you don't have to know all those details. And, and uh, but I was uh, praying about, I knew God wanted me to preach. I was praying about evangelism or or pastoring, and, and you know, as I thought about it, the, the, um, the, the, the um, easy thing, I don't know if you say it that way or not, easy thing about evangelism is you just get to go in and roll grenades, and then you leave, and you don't care what happened. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to live with the fallout, you know? <laughs> you can create all kinds of problems, and then just, you know, go to the next church, um, but as I thought about it too, I thought, you know, the, the downside of evangelism is, is that you don't get to see spiritual growth in people over time. You don't get to see how God brings somebody along and God begins working in their life, uh, from the time that they get saved and, and as they grow in the Lord, you don't get to see that because you just, you're just kind of one and done. You're just kind of in and out. And, uh, and you, you don't give it much thought because you're on to the next church. But pastoring, is, is, it is laboring, it is, it is intensive, and, and, uh, but it's also, it can be very discouraging because it's not like, you know, building widgets. You know, if you're, if you're making widgets, at the end of the day, you've got a stack of widgets. You can see what you did. But when in ministry, many times, if the work is being done, it's done in people's hearts. And that's not as easy to see sometimes. You say, well, can you ever see it? Well, yes, sometimes you, you end up seeing it later because the life starts to bear fruit. And you're grateful for that because why? Because it, we all want, to, we all want to, to have what we do to matter for Christ. I remember my dad in the last uh, five years or so of his life with Parkinson's disease. And uh, until that time, he'd been sick for man, 15 years with it, I suppose, about 15 years. And he got worse and worse. And he got to where he, you know, he could not uh, pastor. And so he was, he would, but he would be glad to fill the pulpit and he would preach. Uh, but I, I told him, I said, hey, hey, Pops, I said, you know, your, your sermons are getting shorter. Man, when I was a kid, man, you, 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 like, you, know, you were like Pharaoh. You would not let the people go. And he said, he said without blinking an eye, I said, when you were a kid, you needed it. And, uh, and so you needed those long sermons, amen, just trying to get it into you. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, it, you know, if you, when you're, you're not wrong, you know, <laughs> so, but I, but toward the end of his life, you know, he, he said, I, he just never got to, wanted to get to where he wasn't useful, to where he wasn't useful. And, um, even six or seven years before he passed away, you know, he would get an opportunity to preach 
and it'd have to be, uh, in a lot of ways, it'd have to be helped, helped up on the platform and helped to the pulpit, and, and he would preach for 15 or 20 minutes, and, uh, and he'd always just, he'd always just preach uh, the goodness of God and, and what, uh, what Jesus meant to him and how good God is. And, and he'd stand for 15, maybe 20 minutes at the most and, and just preach that and have to be helped down. And he was okay with that. He was okay as long as he could sit at his desk at home and read the Bible and listen to, listen to preaching on tapes, right? Uh, remember what that was like, right? And uh, listen to preaching on tapes. And, and he'd sit in his office and read his Bible and study. But eventually, because of the Parkinson's, he got to where he couldn't even do those things. And he said, I never wanted to get to the place where I was not useful. And we all want our lives to matter. And, uh, and, and so esteem them Count them, give, count, count them valuable in love. Show them uh, love uh, from, your, from your life, from your family. For their work's sake, recognize that the ministry is their life. And then he says in verse 13, and be at peace among yourselves. You have no idea what it is to have well, maybe it, I say you have no idea. Yeah, I mean, you have glimpses, you know. Um, parenting, if your children aren't getting along. And I don't mean, you know, you know, fighting over the last hot dog or arguing about shoes and things like that. I mean, they just, if they just don't like each other. I mean, they just, they're just, you know, hateful to each other. It's, 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 it's uh, disturbing. Breaks your heart. And, and the same thing is true in ministry, that uh, when, when people are at peace with one another, when they're, they're not having conflict with one another, it helps the pastor to be able to, to do what he does with joy and not grief. And why does that matter to you? Because if he has to do it with grief and, and uh, co through conflict, it is unprofitable for you unprofitable for you. Um, and so what, what do we need to do? Okay, so we show love. We show, uh, we, we value them. We understand this is, this is their labor and they're laboring uh, on our behalf. And how can we do that? How can we do that? Uh, well, back in our text, uh, the Bible says, um, know them which labor among you, see them, be aware of them, conscious of who they are and their needs, etc. Uh, show them the respect, they are over you in the Lord and admonish you, respect, show them respect for the purpose that they have, uh, that, that they are there for. And um, and so how, how can we do that to, to esteem them highly for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves? Um, I would say to take their ministry seriously, to take it seriously, that it, 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 that it matters. And, uh, and if, it, if it doesn't, if preaching doesn't matter, then let's stop doing it. If preaching is not, if we're not going to take heed, then, then why have it? Let's just have a social club and get together for dinners and, and things like that. But if it's going to matter, then let's take it seriously. Take God's house seriously. Take, uh, and, and in many ways, and in many cases, this is, it, it happens. And so I don't, I don't feel like, you know, uh, you know it's, it's be one thing. If none of this stuff was happening, and I got to say, come, you know, do this stuff like I'm chewing you out for something. I don't feel like that at all. It's just an admonition to say, let's, let's take it, uh, if it, okay, if it's, it's, it's like, okay, if the, the wife, if we're going to say, okay, you know, every, every day, you know, she's the one that puts supper on the table. And you may or may not show up. Well, you're not esteeming her labor very highly. You may or may not come. Or it's like, 
you know, it's, uh, uh, I was, I, uh, after service today, uh, I knew that my wife had fixed a, uh, a nice lunch for me. But I had a couple of errands to run afterwards, and, and I, was, I was getting some hungry. Amen. Uh, after, after preaching this morning, preaching is, preaching is tiring. Those of you men that fill the pulpit, you know preaching is tiring. It's spiritual labor. And so uh, I was some hungry, and I was so tempted to, to run through a drive through somewhere. Uh, but I, but I, I knew that, man, if I go home and my wife fixed me a nice meal and I come in and I say, man, I'm not all that hungry. I might not be able to preach tonight. You know, I just, <laughs> through, through the, you know, the swollen lips and stuff like that, you know, taking my beating. And, and, so, and so I fought the urge. I mean, I've got, I've got, I've got points at McDonald's. I could have got a free cheeseburger. And I said, nope, not getting a free cheeseburger. I'm not going to do it. Uh, and, uh, and I saw every, you know, when you're hungry, you know, say, you notice every fast food sign on the road, right? And so, and so Arby's, man, they're running a deal, you know, you know, something for four bucks or whatever. And I'm like, I just, I'm just right here. You know, I can just run through there. You know, Taco John's is just down the road and, and I could drive down that road and I could hit Hardee's, Burger King and McDonald's all along the way. And uh, I'd walk in and she'd say, hey, lunch is ready, lamb. You know, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> oh, did you, did you go get something to eat? Well, yeah, I started off with, with uh, Arby's and I got, uh, you know, I got sliders at Arby's. I got burritos and tacos at Taco John's. I got some of great curly fries at Hardee's and a Frisco burger, Right? That's like a grease bomb, you know, just waiting. And then, and you know how I love, you know, free burgers at McDonald's, you know. And, um, and if the Vikings, if the Vikings score two touchdowns that week, you can get a free Big Mac. And I'm just like, this is, you know. And so I'd say, yeah, I, I hit that, I hit this, I hit that, I hit that. And then she'd hit me. And, uh, and that would be it. But it, it would not be esteeming her labor as worthy, as worth something. Having, uh, worthily is meaning having worth, having worth. And it is, it is what we are to do. And I was thinking about this, um, say, well, pastor, you know, yeah, you're saying these things because you're the pastor. No, really, really that's not it. Really, this message was born out of the fact that, as I said this morning, coming up on Veterans Day, I was thinking about veterans in ministry and about those, the three men that had, I think at least, the greatest spiritual impact on my life and ministry. Uh, and that one was my dad. Uh, one was my pastor, Pastor Quinn. And another one, uh, Brother Frank Williams, that was seen that took a a big interest in us when we were just young in the Lord, young in the ministry. And, uh, and it, there have been others, but I was just mindful of them. And that's what this message was really born out of because they are to me and have been to me uh, what I desire to be to others as well. And you know we, what we need? We need, we need someone to, to pray for us. We need someone to give us strength. We need someone to counsel and guide. We need someone uh, that, uh, that will uh, tell our children the same things we're telling our children, right? Uh, I, always, I always appreciated Sunday school teachers because then it just wasn't just hearing it from dad uh, because they're hearing it from Sunday. I appreciated uh, Christian school workers because they're telling them the same things, not just hearing it from dad. And so to, to um, show them, so to take, to, take it, to take it seriously, to know them, to love them, to esteem them, and to be at peace are things that we can do for those who labor among us in the Lord that, that uh, exhort us or... Um, admonish us, as the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.12, and that they might do it, as Hebrews 13 says, that they might do it with joy and not with grief. And it is so that this is God's plan. 
is what God desires to have happen. Uh, and isn't it always much better when we're following God's plan? You know, in the home, it's God's plan for the parents to bring up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It is God's desire for the children to be obedient to their parents, amen, and, to, and that it's all based in love uh, and obedience. And that's when it works best is when it works God's way when it works God's way. Father, I pray that you would help us to rejoice in your wisdom, to realize what we would need to establish the New Testament church. And as the book of Ephesians says, to put in that church those uh, people that are necessarily gifted for the edifying of the body, for the work of the ministry, until we all come in the unity of the faith. God, I pray that we would uh, gladly follow your plan, that we might rejoice be, and because we do it with in peace because we do it in love. We are way uh, more effective in carrying out your purpose, which is that we are sent out into a lost world with the message of the good news of the cross of Christ. And, and Father, I pray that we would be more fruitful that we might have fruit, much fruit, more fruit, and fruit that abounds. We give you the praise and the glory for what you will do in Jesus' precious name. Amen. With our heads bowed.